But we are going to transition now to a special program. Sarah Reith is on the line with DA uh, David Eister, Sheriff Matt Kendall, and Chief Probation Officer Eisen Locatelli. And they are going to be talking about the situation with the inmates being released to Mendocino County. Welcome, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks, as always, Drew and Alicia, for that update. Um, we've got four special guests today, actually. We've got also got uh, Ukiah, Ukiah Police Chief Justin Wyatt. And, of course, the last time we got together with all four of these law enforcement officers was back in April, when our fifth COVID case was a recently released inmate from the state prison in Chino. That person was supposed to go to Stanislaus County, but wound up in Ukiah, where nobody knew who, where he was for several days. Now, after prisoners have been transferred from Chino to San Quentin, several prisons are reducing their populations by releasing thousands of inmates with six months or less left on their sentences. And that means that some Mendocino County residents who have been incarcerated at state prisons, not just San Quentin, will be coming home a little bit earlier than expected. So I'm going to start with Chief Probation Officer Eisen Locatelli with the basics. Um, how many of those inmates who are being released early are going to come to Mendocino County over what length of time and what measures are we taking to keep everybody, including the former inmates, safe from the virus? Sarah, thank you for that question. Uh, Eisen Locatelli, Chief Probation Officer. Um, I was prepared to tell you that we were going to have, uh, by July 31st, uh, 3,510 released to the, throughout the uh, state of California um, early. Um, since that announcement, um, the state has announced that it's actually going to be closer to 8,000. And I'm not sure if the 3,510 are part of that or if that's an addition. Uh, that's been some of the problems with this entire process. It, it hasn't just been micro level detail changes, but whole macro level changes have been happening, which is making planning difficult. Um, I'll tell you as of July 31st that we're expecting 16 inmates to be released. That's between parole and, uh, and PRCS, which is monitored by probation. And I don't say just early released, I, I mean released because some of them um, are just time served and the state's not actually releasing them early. Um, 11 of those are going to be responsible to county supervision and then the other five are going to be um, parole, which is monitored by the state. Um, and the new additions, uh, they haven't come out yet with what uh, the county assignments are going to be. And as you mentioned, these are inmates that are residents of Mendocino County, or this was their last county of resident when, residence when they were sentenced. So, you know, it's not like we're getting um, San Francisco inmates released to Mendocino County. Right. And we're not getting a giant influx of thousands of people. I think that's been something people were worried about. But as of now, it's just 16 people that we can expect. As of July 31st, we should expect 16 releases to Mendocino County. And uh, we heard last week that there's still a significant cost to quarantining people, making sure that they can be fed and stay safe and get medical care. Um, one of the inmates who was released from Chino back in April just died in a flop house in LA with no medical care. So are we going to be able to pay for appropriate care for these people? So there's been a lot of work um, involved in what happened in April and a lot of consternation across county level uh, partners uh, giving feedback to the state on how poorly that was done. Um, this time around, um, I will say that, again, it's been difficult uh, due to the changes in the amount of communication, um, but there are systems in place that are different this time around. Uh, for instance, if they test positive um, or they are quarantining in a state prison this time, the state actually drove two of our inmates all the way uh, from Southern California up here um, and put them in hotels um, where they're um, putting them up and they're feeding them. And um, the medical still needs to be provided by the, by the county, though. Um, but they are quarantining them and driving them, which did not happen in the April releases. And one was, was one of our major concerns um, of how he got here, how many people he potentially affect, uh, infected. But they are, at this point, testing all the inmates prior to releasing. And like I said, if they're positive or, um, 
or uh, exposed, they're going into what's called Project Hope, and that's a state-run program. And is the county also testing and quarantining them, even if they have been tested and quarantined by the state prison? That's been the piece that I'm working on with our county uh, public health department. If if they're coming out of a hotspot prison, regardless of a negative test, I've suggested that the county um, should quarantine them um, and that we should be testing them regardless of what the state is uh, giving us. And that's something that we're still working out. We don't have any of that happening as of July 9th when I received my first inmates. We've only had um, those two that came back in quarantine and one of those, of course, um, is now in the jail. Um, let's, um, let's actually go to that now. I was going to circle back to that issue later, but this seems like a good time. Um, over the weekend, we did get a couple of inmates and one of them violated his probation and went back to jail wearing an ankle monitor. What is the concern with, with sending people who may have come from a coronavirus hotspot into our jail, which I understand is still virus free. Um, do you want Sheriff Kendall to answer that question or do you want me to answer that? Sheriff That's Kendall. A, yes, so, Sheriff, Sheriff Kendall, what's your concern about having um, people who violate their, their probation and quarantine in the jail? Are you equipped to, to quarantine people safely? We are equipped to quarantine people safely, but we, we also have to understand that there are people who belong in jail and people who don't, or simply don't. Um, the gentleman who decided that he would violate uh, the orders of the probation department, violate, uh, you know, his, his, his orders of probation regarding no alcohol and things like that, he is a person that we absolutely need to take in. We absolutely need to quarantine him. We have the ability to do so. Um, we have a medical isolation bed. We have room to quarantine about six males in, in our current configuration and three females um, because we have those cells that vent directly out to the atmosphere. We aren't spreading anything around in there. But the concern is always with a person who, you know, is a homeless person or has mental issues, things like that, um, who haven't done anything um, with the exception of they've got COVID-19. Um, I do not want to see any of those folks come into the jail because for a lot of reasons, first off being they could be victimized while they're in there uh, because of their mental status, because of their inability or the fact that they're not regular go to jail people. Um, and that gets a little concerning for me. We've got to have, and we're working on with, with the DOC, some good sheltering and quarantine practices for people like that, that are in that extremely vulnerable population. And uh, before I turn to District Attorney David Eister, I want to let our listeners know that after I ask a few questions, I'm going to open up the phone lines to the public. And the phone number for that is 895-2448. If you have some questions for our law enforcement about the recently released inmates who are due to arrive in the county. Um, District Attorney Eister, back in April, you decided not to press charges against the former inmate from Chino or anyone who is involved with bringing him here because you didn't want to introduce the virus to the jail. And I'm wondering what your approach is going to be now with, with charging people or basically sending them to jail if they might be coming from a hot spot. Well, well sir, I'm not sure that's completely accurate. Back in April, um, we didn't have a substantive crime offense. We had someone that was supposed to be in, um, in essence, Modesto, Stanislaw County, whose aunt instead brought him here because he was going to be homeless on the streets in Stanislaw, and she was going to provide him shelter at her home here in Ukiah. Um, my, my concern in April was not so much um, the parolee, but the way that the prison system had handled um, they hadn't told us about it. They didn't do good testing. So, you know, because I'm mad at the Department of Corrections doesn't mean I take it out on the guy that ends up here. The sheriff, uh, Chief Wyatt and Chief Locatelli have been extremely proactive on this. Uh, on, in April, uh, Chief Wyatt was the guy that really took the bull by the horns and made sure that uh, Pearl Lee got into a... Uh, a quarantine hotel situation 
instead of wandering around the town going into stores as he was the four or five days before we actually located him. So it's a little bit different now, like Mr. Lovato, um, who they were dealing with over the weekend. Again, the sheriff and Chief uh, Locatelli were uh, dealing with him. Um, I, I agree with the sheriff that you, you have the, the Department of Correction looks at people's uh, last offense versus their what I call their body of work. Uh, Mr. Lovato had been convicted twice of robbery in Sonoma County. When he got out of prison on those two robberies, he uh, uh, committed a uh, uh, spousal uh, battery where he inflicted a traumatic injury, went back to prison for that. And then when he got out, he came and did a assault with uh, force likely to, to uh, commit great bodily injury in Mendocino County in 2018. So he's got a record of, uh, of violence. But the prison system calls them nonviolent because his last conviction was for drugs in the jail. So it, I, I, we we have to be careful because the the Department of Corrections is playing a uh, a game of semantics with the uh, the general public. I don't like it, but it's the way it is. So if people commit substantive offenses, um, I make sure that. Uh, uh, they just can't get a free pass because they either claim they're COVID-19 positive or uh, something else. We, we actually have people that are currently coughing in the faces of police officers uh, saying that they're COVID-19 uh, positive in order to try to get the uh, police or sheriff's deputy to back off. Well, that, that's a bad game to play, and I'm charging those people with felonies for doing that, and we'll continue to do it because I have confidence in the jail and with the sheriff's uh, whole staff over there that they can take care of the problem. I, I talk enough with the sheriff that I know that if they are at a point where they're about to break, he'll let me know. Until then, you commit a crime, you go to jail. Well, let's turn to Chief Wyatt. Um are all of the people who are going to be released going to be quarantining in Ukiah? And how is that impacting your department and your efforts to coordinate with probation and other law enforcement agencies? Thank you, Sarah. First of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing us to have this forum to speak to the community on this issue. The four of us have a pretty strong partnership, especially on this matter. And I think being able to, to speak to the community about these issues is, is a great opportunity. And thank you for that question. Um, the impacts to the city of Ukiah, some of, you know, some of these impacts are a little harder or easier to measure than others. The impacts to the Ukiah Police Department or to the city are a little bit harder. The fact of the matter is, um, while these may be Mendocino County residents that are being released, uh, if they qualify for this housing program, the, it's more likely than not that they will end up in the city of Ukiah, even if they came from the coast or, or the North County. So for these purposes, these folks will be city residents. Um, in fact, everybody in Mendocino County that's somehow supported or received services or is supervised in the county will at some point end up in the city. A lot of them remain to receive those services or supervision, or they will come and go. And every resident or visitor to the city impacts the infrastructure of the city, especially law enforcement. I can I can say that every compliance issue that will be brought to light with these people that are being housed after they're released from prison will start with a call to the Ukiah Police Department and we will respond to evaluate the situation and see who, uh, who can help us deal with the situation. Any compliance issues, any health issues, I, I am sure we'll start with a call to the police department. We're already understaffed, I said that before. Um, what we're dealing with right now are, are uh, the regular COVID enforcement issues. Uh, we're in fire season. Uh, public safety power shutoffs are around the corner. Uh, during the COVID crisis, uh, the severity of our calls, for some reason, have escalated in severity. Uh, we deal with mental health clients more and more. Their behavior seems to be escalated. Crimes of violence are up, thefts, drugs. So we're already, uh, pretty impacted by what's going on with, with a pretty short police force as it is. And the sheriff will tell you that uh, he needs to try to keep every person that is a uh, COVID related violation, other than the ones he, he described earlier as being uh, deserving of go to jail. 
and he's right. We should keep the people that are mental health clients or, or just just only commit a COVID violation out of jail. But the fact is, there's no alternative. And every person that is kept out of jail will remain on the streets of Ukiah for us to deal with. And this is a question, I think, for Chief Wyatt and Sheriff Kendall. Um, are you concerned that some of these recently released inmates are going to end up homeless and don't have a place to quarantine safely? That seems to be the cycle. Yes. Well, and you know, a lot of things with the, 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 the CARES Act and whatnot, that is just kind of a stopgap for that 10 to 14 days. After that, there is nothing in place. Um, and then, of course, I get concerned about the inmates that are released six months early. When they get released during that six months, if they get picked up for a subsequent crime, now I'm housing people on the county's dime who actually belonged in state prison on the state's dime. And so that's, um, you know, one of those unintended consequences. And at this point in time, with the judiciary, um, with the, the zero dollar bail and everything else, our jail has been condensed down uh, to the point where we have people we simply cannot turn loose. The judges have weighed in on it and said, you cannot turn these people loose. They are too big of a risk. Okay, we've got a caller with a question. Alicia, can we take a, a question from the public? Caller, you're live on the air. Do you have a question for our law enforcement about the recently released inmates? Um, yes, I just want to thank you guys for the show that you're doing, for the information you're putting out, and for the efforts you're making to protect our community. Um, I'm concerned about, you know, statements being said earlier about them not being able to adequately protect the community from people who are violating the, the county health codes and the state health codes, uh, particularly interested in restaurants and stores that aren't wearing masks or using proper procedures. Is there any facility or anybody in the county that's actually monitoring uh, that people and businesses are actually following the health code orders? Uh, or is it just a willy-nilly, we hope, cross fingers and, you know, don't say anything, don't approach them, don't take a picture of them because we can't deal with them? I'm just a little curious about what is being done to protect our community based upon the laws that have been instated by our county and our state and it sounds like the police are overloaded and they're not willing to or not able to enforce the codes that are actually there for the protection of our public safety. So I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Um, so that sounds like Sarah, a slight... Yeah. Sarah, can I answer that question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, District Attorney David Eister. So I, I, there, there's many ways to enforce uh, violations of the law. And in Mendocino County, we actually have the benefit of uh, either criminal statutes or administrative statutes. The sheriff uh, uh, helped along with others to get the, um, the uh, face mask, the, the masking ordinance where you can be uh, fined an infraction amount for violations. I, I think what everybody has wanted to do in this whole thing is to first start with an education approach to try to explain to people why um, it's important that they follow the, the rules that have been set forth, follow the science, as I say. Um, if they don't, um, I, I'm not sure that the jail is the right place for those folks, and I'm encouraging administrative citations. Uh, a commercial, uh, a profit-making business can be fined up to $10,000. I think we saw that in the uh, case of the restaurant owner over in Mendocino. Uh, other folks uh, can be uh, cited for non-commercial violations of up to 500. And then we have administrative sanctions for uh, up to first offense, $100, second offense, uh, $200, and then third offense, $500. Um, again, after we try to educate the people and get them to, to have compliance. Sheriff, would you agree with that? Uh, Sheriff Matt Kendall? Absolutely, Mr. Eister. Um, that combined with the fact that uh, a, a lot of the work that was done, and I got to give a shout out to the district attorney on this for helping us with this, was to allow for measured responses to what is going on at the moment. And we can have code enforcement officers, we can have um, health enforcement officers, we can have a lot of different people 
who fit the bill better at times than a deputy sheriff. Currently, I'm looking at a pile of cases that we're we're investigating, including that the smothering death of the seven month old child. I can't afford to peel people off of that to go out and work the masking ordinances because I don't have the personnel to do it. However, we can all work on it together and we can we can have a force multiplier if we bring these other agencies in. And thanks to this this new ordinance, this this urgency ordinance that we put in place, we have the ability to do it. I'd like to turn back to Chief Locatelli now. Um, we touched on the two uh, recently released inmates who have already arrived and how they may be partly under state jurisdiction, but they're wearing ankle bracelets. Um, I'm wondering who's monitoring those ankle bracelets and what level of precision you can get from that data and, and how actionable it is. It sounds like um, you learned that Mr. Lovato had gotten alcohol when you returned to the hotel to speak to the second person. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the communication between the state and the county and who's in charge. And we'll take another call as soon as you answer that question. Okay. Um, yeah, so the state is just bringing them to us and putting them in when they're, when they're COVID positive or when they're exposed. And then it begins county supervision. So it is passing the responsibility back onto the county for the supervision. And we're trying to stop those gaps in the system by giving them uh, direct supervision via the GPS, because of course that's three, uh, you know, 24 hours where our officers aren't. Um, that GPS unit um, is paid for by our department and it, and it did capture him leaving um, timely. I just happened to be at the same hotel dealing with another inmate when I, when I saw the situation and effectively violating um, the order of the quarantine that both Sheriff Kendall and I very expressly told him, do not leave this room under these penalties. Um, and he happened to be coming back with the alcohol. So we dealt with it extremely timely. Um, we're currently monitoring the other person. We have real time data on it and it's as reliable as clouds and satellites and um, everything else that could affect, um, you know, a remote signal, but it's just right down the street in detail. Okay. Do we still have our caller on the line, Alicia? All right. Caller, you're live on the air. Hi. Um, I just want to thank the DA and the sheriff for their new uh, orders for the masking and being able to not have the 24-hour advance notice. Um, but I was wondering, and I guess this goes for everybody, if they actually feel more comfortable than with knowing that these inmates are coming in and there's a small amount of them and knowing their background and where they're at and having monitoring versus the large amount of tourists we have in every day that we have no idea where they've been coming from, hot spots, or if they're positive. Um, I just was wondering your guys' thoughts on that, and I'll talk later. Thank you. I could probably answer that one. This is Matt Kendall. Go for it. Um, one of the things that we have to think about as we're dealing with this is there are times, and, and this may sound a little odd to say because some of it's pretty plain, we have some folks who uh, have been to state prison because they have not made the best choices in their life. And like it or not, there are times when you have to look at a person's history to predict the future a little. If I'm concerned about a mother and a father um, bringing children into the county who are going to mask up, who are going to do the things that they've been asked to do. That does not cause me a big concern. When I have people who have, you know, wrap sheets as long as my arm, um, I can tell you they have probably not made the, the, the same decisions in their life. And so there's a reason why they have to be supervised more. And it's because sometimes history is a pretty good predictor of the future. And, and Sarah, we, you know, one of the people that's going to be coming out is uh, has a prior conviction for attempted arson. And you talk about the time of year we're getting into where it's dry, hot, and the lights. I, I worry about that. I don't worry so much about the people that want to go, uh, you know, social distancing, wearing masks, go out and see the, uh, the ocean in Mendocino County. I worry about that arsonist. Right. Um, so here's a question that I'd like each of you to cover. What remains to be done in terms of coordinating information between the county and the state and the, the prisons department to 
make sure that these transfers are smooth because this pandemic could be with us for quite a while as, as we're beginning to understand. Um, Chief Locatelli, would you like to start with that? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> so I, I've been asked to join a task force um, of, of chiefs in the state of California, and I believe there's going to be eight of us to help CDCR with the local impacts at the county level of what their decisions are doing and what we need at the county level to effectuate this decision. We know that it's going to happen. We can't stop it from happening, but we can give them good feedback on what is the result of this. So the situation we had on Friday night, me being there was great feedback to the state about what had happened. Um, th those calls uh, are gonna happen. We're gonna work on them, give them feedback, give them data. Uh, you know, they, the, the food situation, they gave them phone numbers um, to arrange their food, but they actually didn't hand them to the inmates. So, you know, stuff like that, getting them that information. Um, the only reason I ended up knocking on his door to talk to him was because I wanted to make sure that he actually was being fed and didn't need to leave the room. And that's how I was able to deal with that situation so timely. Um, but giving the state that you forgot to give them the number for food, um, that type of real-time information and coordination is, is what we need um, and working with the county to make sure that all the gaps that we can stop as a county are filled. I'm working with public health on those. So I know the, the other uh, three will probably want to jump in on this, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. And we've got a couple of minutes. Let me go to uh, Sheriff Kendall. One minute. <laughs> I'm going to make this quick. Just like everything else, the county always does it better than the state because we care about our people more. And it can be shown from time and time again, from patrol work to district attorney's prosecutions to Eisen's work, we do it better. These are our residents, um, and we're, they're going to get better treatment than, from us than anybody else. But I need to know where, when, and how they're going to be released so that we can get in front of this and give them everything that they need to be successful. And I think we've got about 30 seconds. Um, district attorney Eister, what's, what do you need? Well, I, 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 I think that we have very good communication with local law enforcement. Uh, Chief Wyatt at UPD, the sheriff, Chief Locatelli at probation, we communicate really well. The, the, the problem is the state has not learned how to communicate well with us. And I don't know how to fix that because they're kind of like the immovable beast. We'll just have to encourage them to be more communicative. And Chief Wyatt, would you like to throw in a couple of words? Thank you. 60 I have, seconds. I see I have very, a few seconds, real quick. <laughs> yes, I would just like to be involved in the conversation. I think local, local jurisdictions should have a say in, in these releases. And, and mainly my argument would be that uh, I, I would want to argue that the inmates are placed appropriately within the county and not just in the county seat. Again, as I said earlier, the North County or coastal people will end up in the city of Ukiah because that's where the, the infrastructure is and the services um, I would like to see that, that not only with, with these type of releases, but all services are spread throughout the county. So the impact is spread throughout the county and not just in the county seat, which is Ukiah. All right. Well, thank you, District Attorney David Eister, Chief Probation Officer Eisen Locatelli, Sheriff Matt Kendall, and Ukiah Police Chief Justin Wyatt for talking with us about inmates being released from state prisons to Mendocino County. I appreciate you taking the time this afternoon. Thank you.